Okay, so uh, now we'll work through uh, chapter three. Okay, in chapter three, this is all about uh, descriptive statistics. And with descriptive statistics, we are creating numeric summaries for our data, OK? OK, and so what a numeric summary is, is, is just we're taking, um, you know, imagine your data table has 200 or 300 rows in it. With a numeric summary, we're boiling all of that data, all of that information, down into just a couple numbers, a few numbers that kind of summarize or capture the, the essence of, of the information in that data. Okay? So, you know, imagine a data table. Let's say 200 rows. Okay, with the numeric summaries, we try to, quote, boil down that information into just a few numbers. Okay, and so, so you guys are already familiar with stuff like this. Um, for example, you guys have a GPA. Okay, as students, you guys have a GPA, and and you're very well aware how things could affect your GPA. Okay, and um, and basically, a GPA is a single number that's supposed to capture your academic performance over you know, throughout your academic career, okay? So the, uh, the GPA is, you know, one such numeric summary is a numeric summary that is supposed to summarize your academic performance uh, w with a single number. Okay. Whether that's uh, a fair thing to do or not is, is another discussion, but um, it's, a, it's a convenient thing to do. Okay? So rather, you know, if we wanted to compare multiple students quite quickly, um, one option would be to ask for the entire transcript and we would have to go through every single class and see exactly which class they took, how they did in this class, how they did in that class, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? Or we can just say, oh, what's your GPA? Oh, you have a 3.8. This student over here has a 2.5. You can kind of make some comparisons, quick comparisons based on the GPA rather quickly. Okay? Uh, so numeric summaries, these descriptive statistics, so uh, numeric summaries are especially useful when making comparisons between data groups or data sets. So, you know, we have some numeric summaries that uh, only exist in certain contexts. So, for example, the GPA is a numeric summary that really only exists in an academic context, okay? It, it wouldn't really make sense to talk about GPA for gas prices or something like that, okay? Um, but then, you know, if you're into sports, you probably have numeric summaries for 
you know, whatever sport you're talking about, okay? So you've got, uh, so for example, if you, uh, you know, baseball season just started up, uh, you have numeric summaries for that. You've got on-base percentage, you've got batting average, you've got all sorts of things like that, okay? If you've got, if you're into basketball, you've got, you know, um, uh, points per game, uh, you know, assists per game, rebounds per game, uh, all, all of these things probably, or, you know, um, production per 36 minutes, all of these types of things. Uh, you know, if you're not into sports, you've got other other numeric summaries just for uh, specific purposes. So, for example, if you're talking about um, economic production in a, co a country, you have GDP, GDP per capita, so those are, it's gross domestic product. Um, so you have all sorts of stuff for if you're just trying to uh, summarize something, okay, uh, like this big thing um, with just a, a, a couple numbers, okay? So we have just like um, some numeric summaries. You know, are are specialized for certain situations. Okay, so you got academic, and you have GPA. Okay, and you've got uh, economic indicators. You've got GDP, GDP per capita. You guys are familiar with these things, or am I just gibbering on here? Okay. Um, you have, uh, you know, the Gini index, which is kind of, uh, or it's a measure of income inequality. Okay. So if everybody makes uh, the same amount of money, the Gini index would be like at a uh, at one. And then if uh, if all of the wealth is concentrated into one person and, and everybody else has zero money, then the Gini index would be zero. And, you know, so places where you've got lots of income inequality, you've got low Gini index and places where income is more even, you got stuff like that. Okay, you got, you got sports. Depend, and depending on the sports, you've got entire, you know, for NFL, you've got passer rating, things like that. Or, uh, you know, for... MLB, you've got batting average, on base percentage, etc., etc., etc. Okay. We can. <laughs> um, so these are all you know specific for a certain certain scenario. Um, we also have numeric summaries. Okay, and uh, and it's probably more appropriate to call these numeric summaries. Sample statistics, okay. Sample statistics are numeric summaries for a sample of data, okay. So um, just again, the big picture is you've got some population, right? But what's the problem with the population? Too it's too big, right? The population is too big to be observed directly. So what do we do? We take a little piece called a sample out, and we observe the sample, okay? But our sample can still have, you know, n equal to 300 observations, you know, we might not want to look at all 300 observations individually. So what do we do? We're going to summarize these 300 observations using sample statistics. Okay? So we summarize the data in our sample. And so we have sample statistics that summarize central tendency.
central tendency just is kind of uh, the way to say, you know, what is average, okay? This concept of average, kind of average or typical. What are typical values? Um, and these are the mean and the median. These are statistics for uh, central tendency. And then we have sample statistics for spread and dispersion. Okay, and this would be the uh, the range, the interquartile range. <coughs> which uh, we call the IQR. We also have the uh, variance and standard deviation. Okay. I, I guess it should be important to note that all of these apply to numeric variables only. to write this down. Okay, so we're going to talk about um, you know these measures for uh, central tendency and and, the, and, and whatnot. Okay, um, the book takes uh, makes a point and says um, if data is symmetric, uh, we might prefer We might prefer uh, to use the mean and standard deviation. Okay, and if data is skewed, we might prefer. median and IQR to summarize uh, central tendency and spread. Okay. But any, any of these things, mean, median, IQR, range, standard deviation, variance, they can be calculated for any numeric variable. Okay. So, um, but all of these summary statistics You, you look at the shape. So you'd create like a histogram or a dot plot, and you'd say, oh, that looks right skewed, or that looks symmetric, OK? And it's just kind of a judgment call based on what your brain tells you. And then, and then you say, oh, well, it's symmetric, so I guess I prefer the mean and standard deviation. But the truth is, is all of these summary statistics can be calculated for any data set regardless of its shape, OK? I, I got to say, for any numeric data set. Uh, regardless of its shape. Okay. 
Okay, so let's um, let's start with one of these. We'll start with the uh, the mean. I think many of you guys are already familiar with the mean. Okay, the uh, the symbol for the sample mean has symbol x bar. This is pronounced x bar. Okay. This is uh, the symbol for uh, the sample mean, and the formula is uh, is exactly how we calculate it. Okay, this just means um, this symbol just means add up. Okay, so this just means add up all of your x's and divide by n. Okay, and I think. That's a familiar definition, right? For calculating the mean, you add up the values you have and you divide by how many you have. Okay, so this just means add up the values of x, add up the values, and then divide by the sample size, which is how many you have. Okay, so um, so for example, um, let me. Um, so that's the mean. The conceptual definition of the mean can be thought of as the balance point of our data. Okay, the balance point of the data. Okay, so let's say um, you had, uh, there were four children, okay? So the so family has four kids. And let's say the ages are two, four, six, and 16, okay? And someone says, oh, well, what's the, uh, how old are your kids? But I don't want to know all the individual ages. Just kind of, what's the average age of your kids here? Okay. This is a hard, a hard, a hard question to answer. Okay. <laughs> when you got four kids, it's like, well, I mean, I got three kids that are under six, but then you feel like you're leaving some, an important piece of information out to also say, like, oh, I also have a, a 16-year-old, right? Um, but then you know you can't say like, oh, well, the average is like. 10, that's not true either, okay? Um, but anyway, so if we calculate this, okay, what is the mean? If I add these up, my mean would be 7, right? We add these, add, we do 2 plus 4 plus 6 plus 16, we get 28. We divide by 4, and indeed we get a mean of 7, okay? All right, so I'm going to draw a dot plot here, okay? So we're going to just say uh, this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Okay. So I think uh, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. Okay. So I'm going to draw a dot plot. I'm going to draw on purpose, really big dots. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. Okay. Um, okay. So imagine these are not just dots, but they're like rocks. Okay. Imagine these are stones. And, uh, and imagine this thing is not just a number line, but it's like a board. Okay. And we, wanna, we want this to balance on a seesaw. Okay. Where would I put the fulcrum? Where would I put the little triangle so that our seesaw is balanced? Okay. Well, if I put it over here at 10, what's going to happen to our seesaw? It's going to it's going to tip over, right? Okay. But if I if I put the balance, you know, like right here or even right here, what's going to happen? It's going to tip over the other way. Okay. So it turns out that the point that it stays balanced 
is right here. At, if I put the, uh, the balance at 7, right here at the mean, mean equal to 7, this is where our seesaw is balanced. Okay, and so that's what we mean by the mean is the balance point of our data. Are we good there? Okay. All right. Um, we'll continue on here. Let's talk about the uh, the standard deviation. Okay. The standard deviation. Um, which is also very much related to the variance. And the variance. <laughs> is a measure of spread. OK? Spread is the property of, are your values similar to each other, or are they different from each other? OK? So let's um, let's imagine uh, two families. Okay, we've got the uh, I don't know family Jones, the Jones family, and uh, and the family Robinson. Okay, making this up. All right, we'll say both families. Um, Both families have uh, five kids. Okay, and uh, the average age is nine for both families. Okay. And if that was all the information I gave to you, you might think, oh, well, they sound like similar families. Okay. But if I actually show you the ages of the kids, I think we would all agree that the, uh, the families are quite different. Okay. So for the Jones family, we'll say the kids are 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11. Those are the ages of the five kids of the Jones family. And for the Robinson family, the ages are 1, 5, 9, 13, and 17. OK? If you look at both families, both families indeed have five kids. Both families do have an average age of 9 for their kids. But uh, life in the Robinson family looks very different from life in the Jones family, right? Okay, so you know the Jones family, their kids were just like boom, 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 boom. They all uh, are very close to each other in age. The Robinson family, they're all, you know, spaced out about four years. Okay, so we can see this, and we can look at the numbers, and if we think about the, if we think of this, we can say, okay, it's very quite, it's quite clear that the Robinson has more spread than the Jones family as far as the ages of kids. So here we would say um, high spread. And over here we have low spread. OK? And so this same concept can be applied to any numeric variable. OK? So in situations where you have low spread, the values are quite similar, are quite close. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> are quite close together. And in uh, situations with high spread, the values are more spread apart. 
Okay, and so what we have here, we've got uh, the Robinson family high spread. Okay, so we're going to um, talk about the concept of standard deviation and variance as a way to, uh, to measure how much spread we have. Okay? So the, uh, um, so rather than just kind of eyeballing it and say, oh, those numbers look spread out, or oh, those numbers don't look quite spread out, we can actually have a, a value that we can assign to the amount of spread we have. Okay? So we can think of, um, I'm going to say the standard deviation is just a, it's just a way to assign a value to our spread. Okay? So it's a, okay, and we will say the standard deviation uh, given by the symbol S, okay, the symbol for standard deviation is S, and we're going to say the standard deviation is equal to what we call the, uh, the square root of the variance. And so what is the variance? We're going to say the definition of the variance is equal to the quote-unquote average squared distance from the mean. Okay. The average squared distance from the mean. Say that to yourself. Okay. Average square distance to the mean so from the mean. So what what does that mean? Okay, let's um, let's take a look at the Robinson family and the Jones family, and we will calculate the variance and the standard deviation, kind of based on this average square distance from the mean definition. Okay, you guys all have this all written down? No. Okay. All right. Now yes. Okay. Okay. So I'm gonna again. I'm gonna say the variance can be thought of as the quote-unquote average squared distance from the mean. And, uh, and the standard deviation is what? Square root of the variance, OK? Okay, so let's um, let's look at the Robinson uh, family kids. It's one, five, nine, thirteen, and seventeen. Okay, so what is uh, the mean age of all of these kids? Nine. Nine. Okay, I'm gonna just put a little uh, little one next to that to kind of indicate our, our first step. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find um, distance from the mean. OK? So how far is 1 from the mean of 9? It's 8, eight away, right? How far is 5 from 9? Four. 4 away, OK? 9 is 0 away. How far is 13? 4, Four and how far is 17? Eight. Okay. Right. So you know, one way I could do this, I could just kind of subtract nine from each of these things. All right. And in that case, you know, I would get I would get a negative value here, but you know, it really doesn't matter. Okay. Um, because in the next step, so whether you put the negatives here or not, it, it doesn't matter because this is the distance from the mean. The distance from the mean are all of these numbers. What I want is the squared distance. Okay. So squared, what does it mean to square something? Multiply it by itself. Multiply it by itself. OK, so what is negative 8 squared? 64, right? Negative 8 times negative 8 is positive 64. And what's this squared? 16. And what do I get? This, this squared is, and this squared is, and this squared is. OK, so these are the squared distances. OK, so I'm going to put a little. Uh, three to indicate this is kind of my third step here. All right, now if I want to get the average 
of these. So I've got five numbers for squared distance, right? If I want to get the average, what would I do? Right, okay, so the average, you're just taking the mean, is I would add them up and divide by five, right? But here I have little quote signs around average, so it's not really that, okay? What we're gonna do this time is I'm gonna add them up, but instead of dividing by five, I'm gonna divide by four, okay? So that's why I have the quote average. So quote unquote average, square distance, involves is going to be, you know, add them up, okay, but then divide, instead of by n, which is 5, divide by n minus 1, okay, add them up and divide by n minus 1, so I will say add them up is step 4, and dividing by n minus 1 is step 5 here, okay, so what would I do here, I'm going to have 64 plus 16 plus 0 plus 16 plus 64, and I'm going to divide this by what? Four. Four. Okay, so here, if I add these up, I get 160. 160 divided by 4. This is equal to 40. Okay? Yeah, n is your sample size, okay? And y minus 1, okay, the, the true answer is, is it's complicated and beyond the scope of this course. It's, um, the reason why we do it, you can look it up, it's called Bessel's Correction. It fixes, uh, if, if you were to use n, you'd get a biased estimate of the population variance, and that's not what we want, so to get an unbiased estimate of the population variance, we use n minus 1. The original n is 5, okay? So you don't need to worry about why it's n minus 1. Just know that we use n minus 1. Yeah? How do we know to move that? Are you going to, like, have the quotes on average whenever? No, I'm, I'm not. Well, so you're, you're going to be responsible for learning how to get the variance and standard deviation. So you got to know that this, this thing here, variance is the, quote, average square distance from the mean. This is kind of just like a helpful, helpful way to remember what what we're talking about here, okay? And if you think about, right, the standard deviation or the variance, it's a way to talk about spread, okay? And if we want to talk about how spread out our numbers are, we can say, well, one way to look at it is how far apart are our numbers, right? So we can think of, you know, where's the mean? This is kind of like the middle point. And we say, how far are these numbers away from here? Okay, we're looking at the distance from this middle point, okay? So, you know, we could say, if a, if a room is crowded, we can say, you know, how far away are you from your nearest neighbor, okay? Or like if you're in a urban, uh, dense city environment, you'd say, you know, how close do your neighbors live? And you'd say, oh, my neighbor lives only, you know, 200 feet away from me in the next apartment or something, okay? But if you're out in the countryside, you'd say, well, how far away is your neighbor? You'd say like, oh, the nearest neighbor is three miles away, or something like that, okay? And that gives you a sense of, is it, are the people spread out, or are they close together? Same idea here. Are the numbers spread out, or are they close together? We're looking at the distance, the, how far our values are, the distance the values are from the mean. And we're looking at this. Okay, so here we've got 40. This is equal to our variance, okay? And so if we want the standard deviation, what do I do? I take the square root of this, okay? So the square root of 40 Okay, square root of 40 is equal to 6.325 Okay? And so this will be our last step, step 6. This is our standard deviation. Are all of these, is the process of calculating the variance okay? And does it make sense that this is one way to measure how spread out our numbers are? Yeah? Okay, because we're looking at where is the mean, 
and how far are these numbers away from the mean, okay? And so if the numbers are spread out, the distance from the mean is going to be high, okay? And then, you know, and we're basically getting the average distance from the mean, or it's the, quote, average squared distance from the mean um, to do that, okay? And when the numbers are close together, we'll see that the distance from the mean is going to be small, and therefore the, the average squared distance from the mean will also be small, okay? All right, so... Um, Let's try this out for the, uh, the Jones family. I think that was the name I gave them. Um, all right, so the ages of the kids are 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, OK? Maybe, um, OK, so I'm debating whether I should have you guys do this on your own or if I should walk you through it again. On your own? OK, all right, go ahead and find the uh, standard deviation of the ages of the Jones family, OK? I'm going to pause. If you're watching on YouTube, just uh, pause the video here, because uh, when I come back, we'll go over the answers. OK, um, so your answer should be 1.581. Yeah, good. All right, so if you got, if you got 1.581, then, uh, then you're in good shape, OK? All right, so let's, uh, let's go through this quickly, all right? OK, so we got uh, the mean is equal to 9, right? Yeah, well, no, it's not. Uh, you, the mean, you add them up, right? 7 plus 8 plus 9 plus 10 plus 11 divided by 5 is, uh, is 9. Uh, we subtract off 9 from each of these. You know, you get negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2. It, if you don't have the negative signs, it doesn't matter, OK? This is distance from the mean, OK? Square distance. OK, and so we can see, you know, with the, with the ages um, much closer together, the, the distance from the mean is much smaller, right? 2, 1, 0 versus, uh, what was it, 8, 4, and 0. OK, so our square distances will also be much smaller, 4, 1, 0, 1, 4, OK? And so for the average, we would add these up. 4 plus 1 plus 0 plus 1 plus 4. And then we would divide by n minus 1. So we would get 10 divided by not 5, but 4. So we get 2.5. Okay, So our variance is equal to 2.5. And so our standard deviation, s, would be the square root of 2.5, which is 1.581. Okay? So you're always going to subtract the mean from the, the value. Correct, the correct. Standard. Okay? So, so, um, so what we have here is we got, you know, the standard deviation of these ages is 1.581. And if we. Um, what? Okay, I don't know. Oh, something happened here. Ah, okay. <laughs> my, my, the thing crashed. Okay. Um, all right. So, um, so what we saw is that the uh, the standard deviation of the Jones family. For the Jones, um, S was equal to 1.581. For the, uh, what was the other family, Robinson? Um, it was this times 4, um, 6.324, uh, 6.325. OK, so we see, you know, not Robinson, it doesn't equal 6.325. The Robinson's uh, standard deviation equals 6.325. Um, so what we see is that the standard deviation for the ages of the Robinson family is greater, indicating larger spread. Okay? So just to kind of recap the steps, steps for standard deviation, um, you, know, you can think of it as square root of the variance and the variance being the quote unquote average square distance from the mean. If that doesn't work for you, some people prefer to have nice steps laid out. Okay. Um, and you know, if you don't need the steps, 
Great, if you need the steps, here they are. Okay, so step one, find the mean, right? How do we find the mean? You're gonna what? Add them up and divide by n, right? Add up, divide by n. Okay, step two, subtract the mean from each value to get your distances from the mean. Okay, step three, square those distances. Okay, and at this point, this is where we find the quote unquote average. Add up those squares. And then step five would be divide by n minus one rather than n, okay? And then the last step, this will give us the variance. If we want the standard deviation, what do we do? Take the square root. OK, so those are all of the steps for finding uh, the standard deviation. The, uh, the symbol for standard deviation is s, and, uh, and we We'll write this formula. This is a way to uh, okay, and this basically just captures all six of these steps. Okay, if you like formulas, here they are. If you don't like formulas, you don't have to use this. Okay, all right. You know, step one is finding the mean. We see that by the symbol uh, x bar. You know, let me use a a, a blue pen here. Okay. And then step two is subtracting that off from each value. Okay. Step three is squaring those distances. Step four is adding them up, as we see with this symbol for adding them up. And then step five is dividing by n minus one. And then the last step is taking the square root. Okay. So all six of those steps are captured in this standard deviation formula. If you like formulas, here it is. If you don't like formulas, and this just looks like gibberish to you, don't worry about it, OK? If you can get the standard deviation by following these steps, or if you can get the standard deviation by keeping in mind the loose definition is the, quote, average squared distance from the mean, then, uh, then that's all I really care about, OK? It's a measure of spread. It's a measure of telling us how far apart our numbers are or how close together they are. Are we okay before we move on? Okay, great. So the standard deviation is very useful to us because um, we can then, uh, there's something called the empirical rule. Okay? And what the empirical rule says is that basically most of the data we see should be close to the mean, OK? And this is especially true for unimodal and symmetric distributions. OK, what does it mean to be unimodal and symmetric? One peak, and symmetric means values way up high are just as common as values way down low, right? OK, so this is uh, true for most distributions. Uh, so this is true for most data. And very true, and especially true for unimodal and symmetric data. So unimodal and symmetric looks like this, OK? OK, and what the empirical rule says is that, is there a question? The empirical rule says that most of the data
will be close to the mean. Now, what does it mean to be close to the mean? OK, so we'll be close to the mean. We're specifically going to define it in terms of standard deviation. OK, so rather than saying most data is within three, three units of the mean, OK, which could differ, you know, what is a unit, right? Um, is a unit, you know, are we talking years for uh, ages of people? Are we talking about feet or inches or whatever, you know, dollars, OK? Rather than just saying um, something like that, we're going to measure our distance, distances in standard deviation, OK? So uh, we measure distances in standard deviations. OK, and what this means is that um, what the empirical rule says is that about two-thirds or, you know, specifically 68% of the data. Does it sound like you're super quiet? 68% um, six, of the data will be within one standard deviation of the mean, okay, and I'm, I'll uh, I'll define exactly what we mean by that, okay. Um, about ninety five percent of the data will be within two standard deviations of the mean, okay, and then almost all, okay. 99.7%, so not quite all, but almost all of the data will be within three standard deviations of the mean. OK. And, and when we say we measure distances and standard deviations, this gives rise to another key term or a key concept, which is the z-score. And we will see z-scores very much um, in this class. OK. A z-score is um, the distance from the mean measured in standard deviations, OK, is the distance from the mean measured in standard deviations. Yes? Yeah, I'll, so I'll talk about this, OK? I'm just going to let you guys get this written down, and then we'll go through an example, and I hope it clarifies what all this stuff is, OK? I just want to make sure you guys are ready for me to change slides here. Some of us write faster than others, and that's fine. Can I go? Yeah? All right. So let's, um, so for example, we can say uh, the heights of, you know, men in the USA, broadly follows, is, uh, you know, is unimodal and symmetric. Uh, 
Um, okay, so here, um, so and we can say, you know, the the mean height is about seventy inches. So this is about five foot ten. And the standard deviation is about three inches. OK? And so what this is saying is that, OK, what does it mean to be within one standard deviation of the mean, OK? OK, so what does it mean to be within one standard deviation of the mean? OK, well, the mean is 70 inches, and the standard deviation is 3 inches. So this means to be within one standard deviation of the mean is to be between the heights of what? Heights of 67 and 73. Now, how did I get 67 and 73? Yeah, so 67 is one standard deviation below, and 73 is 70 plus 3, one standard deviation above. Is that OK with everybody? Yeah? OK. So what this says is that about, about 2 thirds, about 68% of men in the USA are between the heights sixty between sixty seven and seventy three inches tall. So that's five foot seven and six foot one. Okay, and that, I think that matches our kind of our intuitive sense, right? Okay. Um, the empirical rule said what? About ninety five percent are within two standard deviations of the mean. OK? So 95% of men in the USA are between the heights of what and what? So 95% of men in the USA will have heights. <coughs> Between, OK, so what do we have? 64 and 76, right? And I got 64 by doing 70 minus 2 times 3. And I got 76 by doing 70 plus 2 times 3. I feel like I'm losing some people here. OK, so who, who am I losing and where, am I, where, where are we getting lost? Okay. Are are you able to articulate what what is Yes. The two. Where where the two? Okay. So here I'm saying no. Rats. My uh, my battery's just died. Okay. Um So it says 95% are within two standard deviations of the mean. Okay? So how much is each standard deviation? Each standard deviation is 3 inches, right? OK, so two standard deviations would then be 2 times 3, or 6 inches, OK? And that's what I've, I've written here. I've got 70 minus 2 times 3, OK? To say I'm doing two standard deviations. Each standard deviation is 3 inches. So that's why I have 70 minus 2 times 3 and 70 plus 2 times 3. Does that clear that up? OK. Do we still have questions about this? Yes? So for the one up there, it was one standard deviation, so that's why it still it remained 3? Yeah, yeah. I, I guess I could have done 70 minus 1 times 3, yeah. and 70 plus 1 times 3. OK? Mm -hmm. But here I've got. Um, 
but you know, one times three is just three, so that I've left it at that, okay? I mean, I could have done 70 minus three minus three, and then 70 plus three plus three, but I mean, that's exactly the same thing, right? Repeated addition is the same thing as multiplication, so. Okay, are, are we okay with this? Okay, great. Okay, and then so uh, let's, let's talk about z-scores a little bit further. So z-scores, that's a terrible z, okay. Z-scores are distance from the mean measured in standard deviation. Okay, so uh, let's again say uh, the height of men has a mean of 70 with a standard deviation of 3. Okay, so let's say a man is uh, 74.5 inches tall. Okay, what is his Z score? So we want to know how far is this man from the mean, but we're going to measure that distance in standard deviations, okay? So we're going to basically say, you know, how far is the man from the mean, okay? And what is that distance in standard deviations? Okay, well, how, how much taller than average is this man? Okay, so we would say, you know, 74.5 minus 70 is equal to 4.5. We would say this man is 4.5 inches taller than the mean. Is 4.5 inches above the mean. Is that okay with everybody? Okay, but we don't, want to, we don't want the answer in just plain old inches. We want it expressed in standard deviations, okay? Each standard deviation is three inches. So what is this distance expressed in standard deviations? 1.5, right? I would do 4.5 divided by three because each standard deviation is three. And so this is 1.5. So we would say this man is one and a half standard deviations above the mean. So this is a z-score, okay? The z-score is equal to 1.5. Yes, question? Yes, there is a formula, but I want to make sure we understand the concept before we get into the formula, okay? So is this okay? Okay, a man who is four and a half inches below the mean would have a z-score of negative 1.5, okay? Is that okay? All right. So, um, so you guys want a formula. Uh, let's see. I'm going to just fit the formula up here. In, in your notes, it should probably go below. But, but the formula is going to be z is equal to the value x minus the mean x bar divided by the standard deviation s. Okay? So basically, we're just taking, taking the distance x minus x bar and we're taking that distance and we're dividing it by s, okay? If you want to put parentheses around here, up, up top, that's fine. Um, order of operations says that's what's going to happen anyway. All right. Is this okay with everybody? Just another minute to write it down? Sure.
Okay. Still got 15, 16 more minutes in class. Okay. All right. So now I'm going to talk about the median and the IQR. Okay. The median, quartiles, and IQR. OK, so the median is another way of measuring central tendency, OK? What's the other way to measure central tendency or express central tendency? The mean, OK? So here, this is the halfway point. The median is the halfway point. Okay. Half of the values will have values larger than the median. Half will have values smaller than the median. And half uh, will have values uh... okay. Another way we can think of the median is the median is the 50th percentile. So the percentile expresses, you know, what percentage of the data is smaller than this thing, okay? So at the 50th percentile, this means 50% of data is smaller than here, okay? Okay. Um, then we have the quartiles, okay? We have Q1, which is the equal to the 25th percentile. And this is known as the first quartile. OK. What percentage of data is smaller than Q1? 25%. OK. 25% of data is smaller. And Q3 is the 75th percentile. So this is the third quartile, meaning 75% of the data is smaller. All right, so, um, and so these are, the median tells us kind of where the center is. Q1 and Q3 are useful to us. They're, they become useful when we talk about the IQR, which is our interquartile range. This is the interquartile range is a, a way to measure spread. What's the other way to measure spread? that we talked about? The standard, the standard deviation, right? OK. So the IQR is a way to measure spread. And the IQR is defined as the difference between the third and first quartile. Basically, we want to know how far is Q3 away from Q1. And that tells us kind of, kind of the amount of spread that we have. Okay. The range is also another way to measure spread. And this is uh, found by doing the max value minus the minimum value, the smallest value. Okay. So you have the range, which tells you the distance from the 
largest to the smallest values. And then the IQR is the distance from the third quartile and first quartile. OK, so these are just some definitions that I'm putting up. Let's, uh, let's talk about looking at an actual data set and finding some of these things, OK? OK, so let's say I have a data set. Um, so to find um, you know, the median and the quartiles in IQR, find median and quartiles in IQR, Step one, and this is the all very important step, arrange your values from least to greatest. Okay. If you forget to do this step, everything else will be wrong. Okay. This is very, the very, very important. OK, so I'm going to go ahead and arrange, uh, let's say I have uh, 12 values here. OK, and these will be, let's say we're going to have test scores. So uh, we have uh, a 60, a 65, and a 70, 88, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 92, and 96. OK, so let's say these are the uh, 12 test scores, OK? OK, all right, so to find the median, we say, OK, 12 test scores. So how many test scores will be larger and how many will be smaller? Six. Right, OK. So we're going to find the spot where six, the six scores are smaller. OK, so I've got, I, so I've already arranged these from least to greatest. So I'm going to go, OK, one, two, three, four, five, six. And I'm going to draw a line right there. And I got one, two, three, four, five, six. Six that are bigger. OK? So here, wherever this line is, which is between 78 and 80, this is going to be my median. OK? So the median here is between 78 and 80. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just take, take the mean of 78 and 80. So here, uh, you know, take So what's the mean of 78 and 80? I would do 78 plus 80 divided by 2. And I get 79. So my median is 79. OK. To get the quartiles, basically, now that I've found the median, I've got six values that are smaller, six values that are bigger. I'm going to treat those six values as their own list. Okay. So now, so if, to find Q1, we say take the six values less than the median. and treat as its own list. Okay? And so we're going to find the uh, the quote median of those six values. Okay? So what's Q1 in this case? Seventy-one, right? So I've got six values here. I'm going to find the spot where what? Three are less and three are more. So that's going to be right here. So my Q1 is going to be 
the average of these two numbers are halfway in between there, and so I get Q1 is equal to 71. Question? Okay, so I'm going to, um, so the median split this into, you know, I had 12 numbers, and it split it into six less and six more, right? Correct. So I've got. So if the median is seventy nine, how many how many of these test scores are below seventy nine? Six of them, right? So I've got these six numbers. I'm going to just treat this as its own list. I'm going to pretend like these ones don't exist. Is that okay? Okay. So if I've got six numbers here, and I want to find the median of those six numbers, how how many will be bigger and smaller? Three, right? So so I'm finding the spot where Three are smaller and three are bigger, so I'm basically finding one, two, three, quote unquote median. In this case, it's going to be Q1. Okay. So you're doing the same things, but in quarters. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I'm just splitting it into quarters. Right? That's where I'm getting the word quartiles. Okay. Okay. Yes. Question. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So let let we'll I'll, I'll address that situation in just a moment. Okay. All right. Okay. So what's the what's Q3? Q3, same process, Q3 will be 87, okay? All right, and then, so what's my IQR? IQR is defined as Q3 minus Q1. This is going to be 87 minus 71, 16. Great. All right, so the question is, you know, what do we do if we don't have, like, a nice set of numbers here, OK? OK, so let's, uh, let's um, add a few numbers here. Um, OK, so I'm going to take these, and I'm going to just add Okay, so we're going to do the same thing. Okay, th but this time, let me um, just add a few extra numbers here. So I've got uh, 96, and we'll say 99, and 100, uh, and then I'll put uh, 55 here. Okay, so here I have, um, now I have 15 scores. OK? So what do I do? OK, so the median will have how many bigger and how many smaller? OK, so with the median, we're going to do 15 divided by 2. And this gives me, what, 7.5? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have 7 smaller, 7 larger, and 1 equal to the median. OK, so I'm going to count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So, so here, my median is equal to 80. OK, so I've got 7 smaller than the median, 7 bigger than the median, and 1 equal to the median. All right, so that's, that's for getting the median. OK, and then so now to get Q1 and Q3, we do the same thing. I've got, so I'm going to take my list of seven. So take the list of seven. And we're going to find what? Three less, three smaller, three larger, and one equal to the median. So what is Q1 over here? 70. 70. OK, so you know, I would split this. And this is going to be Q1. So Q1 is equal to 70. And what's Q3? 92. OK. Is that all right with everybody? And that, that should cover kind of all, all of the situations that you have with uh, finding Q1 and Q3 and the stuff with the, the median. OK. So you know, uh, 
So we, we've got that. All right, one last thing, and I know I've got, I'm like running out of time here, okay? So if you have established your median, okay, you've got your median, you've got Q1, you've got Q3, you've got the IQR. All right, you've got one more graphic display. Okay, and this is the box plot. The box plot looks like a box with a line down the middle, lines that go off like this, and then maybe some values like this. Okay? The box is defined by your three values. Okay? The left edge is the first quartile. This line in the middle is the median. And the right edge of the box is Q3. Okay? So that means the width of the box is equal to what? The IQR is the width of the box. Okay? These things are called whiskers. So the whisker extends to the smallest and largest values that are not considered outliers. smallest and largest values in your data that are not considered outliers. Okay. Now we won't get into the rule of how to decide what is an outlier and what isn't an outlier, okay? But if a box plot shows these little dots, okay, or you know dots down here, these are considered outliers. These are unusual data points, unusually large or unusually low, low data points. Okay, they're still in your data. They are still part of your data. They're just considered unusual. Okay, so if we, if we did a histogram of, uh, of heights in the room and, uh, and one of our students was Shaquille O'Neal, he would probably stand as an outlier, okay? Because everybody is probably, you know, between whatever, five feet and six feet something, and then you got Shaq who is going to be way bigger than pretty much everyone else in the classroom, okay? And so, so he would stand out as an outlier whereas everybody else uh, would be covered by the box plot. Okay? All right. Uh, that's good. Uh, we'll see you guys uh, next week.